I'd like to make four points, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the first is just to pick up on those words, uh, great power politics. It does seem to me we are back, uh, if we ever were in a unipolar world, but we are back in a multipolar world. Uh, we are looking at, surely at Bismarck came back, he would say, uh, looking across the globe, we have, we have four large great powers. We have the United States, we have Russia, we have China, and we have a, I think we have to recognize it, India. Uh, and, and three of those great powers are regional great powers, and one of them, us, declares that we are global, global great power, as well as a regional great power. I like, uh, I like our being reminded of the special sphere of influence we have in, in the Monroe Doctrine area. But so we have to think that this world of in the future and now is one of, of four big guys, and I'm sorry for that gendered <laughs> remark, uh, but that's, that, that's the way I, I, I do see it. And if we think that it's one in which we have a particular specialness, we have a, 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 a larger role, then it just, that to me is the unreal part of it. To get real would be to see that we are in a world of four large powers and also some other significant players like Iran and increasingly, say, Indonesia, who will not want to be pushed around. In this world, I think we will not see a, a Europe, except in economic terms, being able to play a big power role or a great power role. The, the fissions there are too great. So that would be the first aspect of a realist understanding of great power politics. Uh, the second would, and the third that I'm going to mention would be about the United States itself. as one which claims to be different from all of the other powers. The, the, the second is uh, this world power, this great power, is clearly when you look at the military record and when you listen to the military leaders of this country is suffering from quite acute wear and tear. Uh, it, it's not just, as, as I think you now all know, it's not just the wear and tear of our machinery and our men folk and women folk in all of these places across the globe. It's a wear and tear of our aircraft. It's a wear and tear of our communication systems. It's the thinness of our logistical base. It's the thinness of our supply base. It's now clearly the wear and tear of the U.S. Navy. I mean, it strikes me as really curious that the Navy is now the lowest number of uh, functioning warships that has been in the entire post-Second World War period, and yet those functioning warships are, are running out of effectiveness in a, whole, in a whole number of ways. We had a visit recently from uh, Vice Admiral John Richardson, the CNO, to Yale, uh, for other reasons, but we had a chance to talk with him, and it was just as the second, or was it the fourth, U.S. warship in the Pacific uh, had encountered its collision, had encountered its breakdown, and, well, the man looked really, really worried. He, <laughs> he, is, he is running a Navy which is full of, he doesn't quite know where the next, case will happen. And this is supposed to be in a period of peacetime when you could like, uh, sort of reinvest in your Navy. It, it is not extreme stress, and yet it is stressed out. So this, this number one lead power is suffering. The third point I want to make, and I, I feel when I make this, I, maybe I'm banging my head against a wall 30 years after the rise and fall of the great powers came out, uh, we, live in a, we, we live in an age of, and in this city, we live in an age of fiscal amnesia unknown to history. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I, there is no other system in the world 
which could have, the Bourbon kings would have loved the idea <laughs> that they could just float <laughs> deficit spending year after year after year after year, and somebody else inside the country, but chiefly outside the country, picks up the bill. And the historian in me says, like, how long, for heaven's sake, how long is that going to last? I sometimes think that the, the, the fiscal condition of this country is a bit like that Disney cartoon, the roadrunner who goes right over the edge of a <laughs> cliff and keeps like going and going and going and going. And everybody thinks, well, wow. That's really impressive. <laughs> but but we, we don't have wings. We don't have long-term, sustainable fiscal wings. Surely we don't. Uh, there, there are other things one could say about the future of, the, of, our, of our planet. I, I do think that um, conservatives and realists ought to, ought, ought to agree with Obama that perhaps the single biggest long-term threat to us could be in the environmental arena. I, d I don't see there's any reason whatsoever not to concur in that as a, as a, as a different type of threat. But of the, of the world of the great power realists, a world of four big powers, a world in which this country is suffering from wear and tear, and a world in which this country has fiscal amnesia, is a, a future of great power politics, which is uh, not a very happy one as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Mm -hmm.